Peter Dutton, welcome to 7.30. Thank you, Sarah. Scott Morrison says that AUKUS was the most closely guarded secret since the Second World War. When were you brought in on it? Well, Sarah, uh, not long after I came into uh, the portfolio, it obviously was a uh, compartmentalised uh, arrangement, which meant that there were only a handful of people in Australia who were briefed in. And I guess our, our thought all, all the way through was that uh, just the, 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 the size of the US system would mean that it would leak at some stage. But fortunately, that didn't happen and we were able to deliver the deal. And I think it's in our country's best interest and uh, we support the work that the government's doing now. Did Scott Morrison canvass it with you privately when he asked you to be Defence Minister? Uh, Sarah, to be honest, I, I don't recall a uh, uh, private conversation at the time, but certainly I supported it, uh, you know, with, with everything I had. I thought it was in our best interest to get a capability. The advice was clear to us from Defence that the conventional submarine wouldn't be able to operate uh, in our waters because it, uh, of, of technology developments. It could be detected uh, and sunk when it came up to, uh, to recharge its diesel generators. And the beauty of this vessel, of course, is that it can last for 30 years. The reactor is fuelled for that period and it can lurk beneath the, Earth's, uh, beneath the, the water surface uh, and the adversary doesn't know where it is. So there's a great deterrence ability within uh, the Virginia submarine in particular. All of this became possible, as I understand it, when the Biden administration came to power. Isn't it one of the great ironies that this enormous leap in Australian defence capability had to wait for a Democrat administration? Well, and for a Liberal government as well here in Canberra, the fact is that, uh, that the Labor Party had cut defence only 10 years ago, in fact, in the 2012-13 budget by 10.5% in real terms, which brought the GDP spend uh, ratio back to about 1.56%. Uh, so we put that back up over 2%. And I think it's because of that, to be honest, that, that, that Australia was seen as a credible player, both with the Americans and with the Brits. And you're right, there are many people within the Biden administration, uh, Kurt Campbell and others, uh, who, without them, the deal wouldn't have been possible. And I'm very grateful to Lloyd Austin, the Defence Minister in the US, for the way in which he engaged with me and, and now with Richard Miles. So had the government and the Defence Department concluded that Donald Trump as president would have vetoed the deal? I, I don't think it was possible at that stage. I think there was a, a significant engagement uh, with the Trump administration. And uh, I think what the public sometimes miss is that the, the US system really spans administration to administration. So uh, the, the, the interactions that we had with the Pentagon, for example, or when I was Home Affairs Minister with the FBI or the other agencies, it, it's seamless. Uh, there are layers and layers of uh, you know, professional staff, both Democrat and Republicans. And the beauty, of course, of the, uh, the alliance that we have with the United States is that it survived uh, you know, I mean, even Mark Latham and uh, Kevin Rudd and others uh, over a long period of time. So it's served our country. It's in our best interest that it be strengthened. And that's what we achieved through the agreement that we struck uh, through AUKUS. Let's move on from that comparison. But the idea of nuclear powered submarines for Australia had been around for a number of years. It's reported that one of the things that finally made it possible was new technology that enables the nuclear reactor that will be on the boats to be sealed for the entire life of the boat's life. Was that breakthrough technology that made it possible? Well, the Americans definitely wanted to see a bipartisan position, not just support from the coalition and government, but to know that if there was a change of government, which obviously transpired to be the case, that it would be supported by the Labor Party as well. And to the credit of Mr Albanese and to Richard Miles, they supported uh, the AUKUS deal and they did it on the basis that it didn't create a nuclear domestic industry. Mm. And we'll, we'll see what happens uh, in terms of the waste disposal, etc. But we, we will support the government uh, in that stance. As I say, the, the technology is quite remarkable in that it's fuelled, sealed, as you say, uh, the submarine can be powered and circumnavigate the globe for 30 years uh, and not be refuelled. You only need to deal with the waste. And that's, uh, that, that was part of the arrangement, which made it easier. If you went with the French Barracuda, it meant that uh, you had to refuel every seven to eight years from memory and it would have to be back uh, every couple of years uh, or a couple of years, so uh, it was out of service every time it had to go back so, uh, so to, the, to, to France for refuelling. So is it important to avoid non-proliferation problems that Australia never builds its own nuclear reactors for these submarines? 
Well, we have international obligations with the IAEA and we were very conscious of that in the uh, in the deal that we struck with the Americans and, and the Brits and our diplomats have worked around the clock uh, both under our government and now under the Albanese government to uh, to deal with any of those concerns. But there's not a proliferation issue here and anybody objectively looking at what we're acquiring in the nuclear submarine would draw the same conclusion. Now, the reason I ask that, because uh, when uh, Vice Admiral Meade, who led the uh, task force that laid out the what's called the optimal path, the best path forward for AUKUS. When we asked him about nuclear reactors, he was careful to say, we're not envisaging that at the moment. Do you anticipate that Australia could one day have the capacity to build its own nuclear reactor? I, I don't think that's realistic, uh, to be honest, Sarah. I, I, you know, from Jonathan Mead's perspective, uh, he's a person that uh, our country owes an enormous amount to. He has been the, the head of the negotiations on this program from day one, and he's uh, an exceptional uh, Australian. He's served his country with great distinction to, to this very day and hopefully for many years into the future. So there's no doubt he would be leaving options open for decades and decades into the future. But uh, the, the, the IP, if you like, is rested with the United States. They've only ever shared it once with one other country, that's the United Kingdom, in the 1950s and will be the only other country, I think, that they will share it with. So and just, just to be that, clear, that's, that's at the heart of the deal. Of course, that's the nuclear propulsion technology. I was asking you about the reactor. To be clear, you see no point in the future where Australia could be building a nuclear reactor. I, I, I think the technology, uh, as it's been established in the United States and with Rolls-Royce mm. uh, as the manufacturer of the uh, of the reactor in the United Kingdom, uh, I, I think it, it wouldn't make any economic sense, frankly. And uh, we're talking about the propulsion system, as you point out, uh, as opposed to nuclear weapons, and nobody's proposing nuclear weapons uh, for these <coughs> for these submarines. Um, as I understand it, and of course we're waiting for the details to come out tomorrow, but you know more about it than most people, the proposed new British boat will be using American combat systems with American weapons. How important is that to the success of AUKUS, i.e. that we don't have two very different types of boats for the, for the submarines for the future? Well, I, I think it is. I've seen the speculation in relation to that. I, I think it is essential that... Uh, that that system be a feature of the new design out of the United Kingdom. It's obvious that Russia is going to continue to be problematic, not just in relation to Ukraine, but a broader threat to Europe. And the, the, the Americans uh, obviously have a very significant role to play there, but the British, more than anyone, uh, will have a huge tasking for their submarines uh, in and near their waters and uh, across the Channel and uh, in protecting broader Europe as... Russia continues on its current pathway. So the, the, the Brits will understandably and rightly have a very significant obligation there. But as Prime Minister Sunak has pointed out, uh, the Brits have been very keen to step up uh, in the Indo-Pacific. But the Americans will have the more significant role in our region, given their, their equities in Guam and uh, in Pearl Harbour and elsewhere in the Philippines. So the interoperability with the Americans uh, and through their systems for both the Brits and for us is absolutely essential. So when this was being discussed, when you were in government, was there consideration that tying ourselves so closely in with the US Navy would make us more of a target? Uh, quite, quite the opposite. Uh, I, I think the fact is that we're dealing uh, in an environment where Australia hasn't changed her values, uh, Indonesia hasn't, the Philippines, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, all of us crave peace and stability in our region. And that's uh, the absolute underpinning of AUKUS is that it provides a deterrence for any country who may be thinking about uh, taking Australia on or one of the allies of the United States or our partners otherwise. Uh, it's an uncertain time that we live in. The Europeans are pointing this out. Jens Stoltenberg's pointed out his concerns about what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, the build-up otherwise. So uh, we're a population in the end of 25.8 uh, million people. Uh, on an island essentially in the middle of nowhere. And if we think that we can go it alone or that our chances in the next decade or two or the next 50 years is best served by us cutting links with established partners like the United States or the United Kingdom, I think that is wrong thinking. And I think we would be in a very perilous position very quickly uh, if that was the course that we were to take. So we, we've bolstered 
uh, the friendship with the United States and the United Kingdom, India, Japan and many others, and that's in our national interest to do so. Let me just ask you about the numbers because the amount of money that um, the, the figures that are being used today are clearly very, very large. The Prime Minister said in, in uh, more than, possibly more than $200 billion. It's a hard number almost to take in. Um, you've said that this is crucially a matter of bipartisan support. Does that extend to the budgetary savings that will be needed to foot such a massive bill? So what I'm asking you, are you prepared to think outside the usual partisan box to give the government leeway to make budget savings in the national interest? Well, the short answer is yes, Sarah. I mean, in my budget reply speech last October, I said that we would work with the government uh, if they had tough decisions to take, for example, uh, keeping the NDIS sustainable. It's an incredibly important program, but it needs to be sustainable. And if the cost trajectory on that is going to result in it falling over, then uh, I think the government itself has pointed out that that's not sustainable. So if there are different ways in which we can provide support to the government, uh, we're happy to do that. There'll always be points of difference about where spending priorities lay and uh, we'll, we'll work through all of that. But this is over a long period of time. The numbers you're talking about uh, can span into the 2050s uh, and perhaps beyond that. The immediate uh, time of the Ford estimates uh, over the next four years, uh, that's the, the most sort of crucial period to focus on. But mm. we would encourage the government to be transparent about the money that's involved, be upfront with the Australian people, because it is a costly process. But as we know, as history's demonstrated, there's an enormous price to inaction as well. On that bipartisan note, Peter Dutton, thank you very much indeed for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Sarah.